Hi, I'm Anne, and some of you may know me as Anne of All Trades, and today we're going to be talking about hand saws, specifically joinery saws, what you need to be able to get the job done, and how you need to use proper body mechanics to, in fact, get that job done. With Western saws, there's a few important things to make your sawing experience the best that it possibly can be. The first is work holding. You want to have your wood secured in such a way that it's not going to chatter. If you're doing cross cuts, a fantastic easy shot project is to make bench hooks, um, which can be as complex or as simple as you want. My first bench hooks that served me quite well for several years were just pieces of scrap plywood with stops screwed on so that it could just sit on my bench. Keeping it nice and square, it's nice to have actually some little guidelines. These Bad Axe bench hooks have 45s and 90s in them as guides, but as a rule I generally try not to use guides. Um, I really want to make sure that my technique is good enough that I'm cutting a square on my own because your cuts, if you're using a guide, are only as accurate as the guide itself is. Just like anything else in life, with hand sawing, the absolute best way to get better is to practice. When I've really gotten out of practice with my hand sawing, I make it a habit that every day when I come into the shop, I make a series of lines and spend about 10 minutes practicing my saw cuts. And that helps enormously in improving my craft. It helps getting confidence as I start my saw. It helps me to improve my body position. It helps me to improve my technique. I can practice following the reflection of my saw rather than my line. And the nice thing about marking both sides of my cut is then I can get a consistent read on how I'm doing. Just like an athlete might warm up for a sporting event or something like that, this is also a very physical activity. So warm ups become very important. Much like with other hand tools, the magic disappears the moment that your tool is dull. Now traditional craftsmen would sharpen their saws every day after work. So you see these older saws that have been sharpened down to a little nubbin. And I mean, that's because they were constantly being sharpened. And so I myself have been guilty on multiple occasions of letting a saw go for weeks, months, even a year in some cases between sharpenings. Saw sharpening itself can be extremely intimidating, but there's tons of resources available online that can help you get your start. The nice thing is that most dovetail saws or most joinery saws are filed with the rip filing made to make rip cuts down the end grain of your piece and the rip filing is actually extremely simple and the best way to learn sharpen saw sharpening is to buy a few five dollar saws at the antique market and just give a go at sharpening the awesome thing is is that if you spend five dollars on a saw at an antique store you sharpen it up even if it's sharpened badly guaranteed it's going to be in better condition than it was when you bought it and that is a huge boost to your confidence right there so after about five or six times sharpening you will likely see a marked improvement in your sawing and of course then in the enjoyment process of sawing your wood as well so let's talk about body mechanics as we're sawing. I'm ambidextrous, so this makes this demo very easy for me. So we're set up to make a left-handed cut here. I'm going to use my dominant hand, my left hand, and I'm going to use what's called a pistol grip on the saw. Basically what your pointer finger being forward allows you to do is it actually guides your elbow to do what it needs to do to be able to saw straightly. You don't wanna have a, a full fist grip in here because it allows your hand to wander. Also, if there's not space for your hand within the, the saw handle, it's gonna cause all kinds of problems as well. But I've got my dominant hand on here. I've got my non-dominant foot forward and my dominant foot back. I have my hand resting on the piece, securing it to the bench hooks. So I'm using gravity to my advantage here. 
And what this also allows me to do is it allows me to put my thumb here so that I can use the radius of my thumb as a guide as I start my saw cut. Now what is cool that happens here is that if I'm using the radius of my thumb here and my pointer finger, I am actually creating a track for the saw to run along. So if I want to adjust my cut left or right, I can actually just easily do that. And then here comes the next huge issue that people face, which is the tightness of their grip here. And a very good rule of thumb is that if your knuckles are white, you are gripping it too hard. The best way I've ever heard this explained is you pretend you're holding a baby bird. The saw handle is this baby bird. If you grip it too tightly, you will crush the bird. Your cut will wander. You'll have all kinds of struggles as you're sawing. So. Even as you're sawing, especially as you're just getting your few, first few rounds of practice in, it is a fantastic practice to go ahead and start sawing and then to stop and see what's going on with your grip, loosen it, readjust your body however, or however you need to, and then continue to saw at that point. Now, another really important part about this body position is that this hand takes all of the weight off of my sawing hand, which allows me to take all of the pressure off of the saw. One of the biggest things I see people struggling with is they're pushing too hard on the saw, which makes it really hard to cut. Whereas if you simply take all the weight off of the saw and have you know, a solid system of support and your body positioned in such a way that your arm can swing freely without you know, getting in the way of the rest of your body, then you'll be able to make very easy sockets. So let's talk about starting the saw. Pretty much everyone who, everyone I know who is grandpa, uncle, etc., taught them how to woodwork starts their saw like this. There's a couple reasons why we don't want to do that. First of all, it dulls your saw teeth really quickly. It also, if you were to look at this under a microscope, basically makes the opposite of the saw's tooth pattern in the wood. So then after you've back sawed here to start your cut, then then going and moving the saw forward becomes actually even harder due to the fact that you've made basically these anti-cog patterns in the wood. The saw start can be an extremely contentious topic and I've long said that if it works for you, then it works. The entire point of this video is to give you a few tips and tricks that you can add into your regimen to help you have a more enjoyable experience when you're using your tools. So if we are gonna start the saw on the push stroke, we want to come all the way to the end of the saw. We want to have all of our body pressure here. We want our arm to be able to swing freely. We want our pointer finger pointed towards the direction that we wanna cut. We have the radius of our thumb here safely above the saw teeth. If you put your fingernail down there, you're gonna get a free little fingernail clipping, free little manicure there. So we're using the radius of our thumb and you know, positioning our body in a way that's comfortable. And we're just gonna gently start the saw. Where there's no pressure on it. If anything, I'm angling my saw up ever so slightly so that I'm not trying to cut across the entire edge of the board. So I'm starting on the far corner with the saw slightly angled up and I'm just going with confidence there. As I have confirmed that I'm sawing the that my saw is straight, that my cut is straight, that everything else is good, then I can continue to go on across and fall all the way down across my line and finish my saw cut. Now, there's also some really cool things about some of these newer saws that have shiny plates. If you have a shiny saw plate that's reflective, then if you're making an, a square cut, then what you can actually do is watch the reflection of your piece in the saw plate and if it's making a continuous line then you know that your saw cut is straight. Some other I'll just finish this cut. Another thing that you can do to make your life easier is to make a knife kerf. So if I've marked my joint joint out with pencil or whatever else, then I can put my knife in the pencil line, slide my combination square up to it 
and then I start with one very light pass to just sever those fibers. And then I take a few more deepening passes so that I have a nice little starting point for my saw. Then I can set my saw down in it and use that as a guide. Another thing you can do is with each saw stroke, you can release the saw and see what's happening. If it's jiggling all around, then you've got some adjustments in your technique that you need to make. But then some other things to focus on as you're making these you know, practice strokes is that you want to be using the entire length of your saw. Now let's talk a little bit about rip cuts where you're cutting down along the grain. One thing that is really helpful is making sure that your board is secured in such a way that it won't chatter. Now, you notice that it's in an auxiliary vise here. Now, the reason for that is that I have a very low workbench that is that height specifically so that my center of gravity is directly over my work when I'm hand planing. However, when you're doing intricate joinery work, you don't wanna be hunched all over your bench or it's going to negatively affect your sawing technique. Um, one or two cuts in that position is totally fine, but if you're going to be making repeated cuts, you wanna make an adjustment. So this is an awesome tool for work holding that is called a moxen vise. And just like the bench hooks, this can be as simple or as fancy as you want. Some of the two most popular places to get hardware for these moxen vices is from Benchcrafted or from Texas Heritage Woodworks. When we're sawing by hand, we want to eliminate as many variables as possible. And one way we can do that is to think about what a back saw or joinery saw does. Why does it have this back? This back is there to add rigidity to the saw plate, but also to help gravity do its job. So if we get out of the way of the saw, it will saw directly down to the earth, just as gravity intended. So to assist the saw in using gravity to its advantage, we always want to make sure that our workpiece is secured squarely in the vise. So I'm looking down into the vise right now and I am making sure that the work is square within the vise so that there's that variable out of the way. If I'm sawing crooked, it's gotta be my technique or a problem with my saw. Another quick tip when you're sawing by hand is that you want to have some kind of lubrication on your saw. That can come in the form of beeswax or mutton tallow. I personally prefer mutton tallow because you can melt some into a little chapstick container and then no muss, no fuss, it slides on there really easily and then the oils don't affect the finish in your workpiece. I'm gonna do this right-handed so that we have that example as well. I want ideally to have my piece basically so that I'm sawing at 90 degrees. Incidentally, um, I mean, depending on how deep my saw cut was here, I would be a tad high still. So I actually want to lower it down a little bit, re-square it in the vise and tighten it nicely. The other really nice thing about this Moxon vise is that it supports so much of the workpiece. So you have so much wood in contact with wood. And so really chattering becomes an issue of the past. I'm going to put my saw in the cut. I want to take all of the weight off the saw and then just confidently saw forward. Once I'm assured that my saw cut is straight, I can go ahead and saw away. And that's about all there is to it. So you'll notice that I have quite an array of saws here. The reason for that is that each saw serves a different purpose. There's a dedicated saw for each dedicated job. Now, if you are solely hand tool focused, you're going to need a lot more dedicated tools. However, if you're doing hybrid woodworking, which is the majority of what I do, you can actually get away pretty darn well with just one saw and what I like to do is do what's called a hybrid filing on my saw. And what that allows me to do is do rip cuts and cross cuts with a fair amount of success on 
either style of cut. When I'm considering my woodworking budget, I like to have as few tools as possible to do the jobs that I want to do well. So this is one of my favorite saws because it's a great all around saw size. I can do 99.99% of the woodworking that I do with this saw because you're going to be able to cut as deep of tenons as I generally use. It's still small enough and wieldy enough that you can use it to cut dovetails if you need to. That said, if I am cutting dovetails, I that is a tad unwieldy and I really do prefer a much smaller saw. I also have monsters like this and like this, which as you can see by all the dust on here, it doesn't get used very often. But like I said, you can do pretty much everything with this. And then if you're feeling real luxurious, you can restore an old dovetail saw or go ahead and invest in a quality dovetail saw as well. So let's talk a little bit about cutting dovetails. What I like to do as far as my sawing technique is get my body positioned correctly, start my saw as if I'm going to make a straight cut, ensure that I'm cutting, that my, that my lines are all lined up and everything, and I'll actually get it to where all the teeth are buried in the cut. And at that point, I will make the adjustment down to cut the angle of my dovetail. Now we talked a moment ago about gravity doing its job as far as your placement of your piece in your vise. And so logic would have it that you could actually position your piece at the angle in which you're cutting your dovetails so that then of course you can saw straight down. The only reason that I don't do that is because it just adds too much time to my sawing process. I mean, it works just fine. It's just, I don't wanna be moving my piece 15 different times. So before we end this video, I want to just show you a few different saws in action and talk about why they're different than their friends. One of the most innovative saws of our time is the Glenn Drake joinery saw. And it has several claims to fame, mainly the blank period in front of the saw and the progressive pitched teeth, which means the teeth are smaller and bigger at different places. This makes it a little bit more of a challenging saw to maintain, but the theory behind the saw is that it makes it significantly easier to learn the proper body mechanics of a saw. Here's the dedicated dovetail saw, and again, you're just going to start your saw, saw cut nice and straight till all the teeth are in there, then you're going to establish the angle of your dovetail cut, and go ahead and saw down to your line there. Here's just a custom handmade saw from a saw kit from Gramercy, and this is for ultra, ultra fine dovetails. It has an extremely thin plate. Once again, though, a nice sharp, a nice sharp saw makes all the difference. It has a different hang, which will allow you to saw um, on a lower surface. Here is the big honking uh, saw for cutting big joinery. But the thing is, with a nice sharp saw, you can really get away with anything. You can cut dovetails with this, just like you can cut dovetails with basically anything else. The main thing that I want to do with this video is to take some of the mystery out of how to use hand saws because just like every other thing with woodworking, it's really not rocket science. It's just a matter of using a sharp tool and proper body mechanics and proper work holding to be able to accomplish the job that you would like to do. Because at the end of the day, no recommendation from me is going to be nearly as helpful to you as practicing and becoming a discerning customer as a result of building your own skill sets. So thanks so much for tuning in.